Let me go ahead and say good evening to everyone. Very, very thankful to see all of you this evening, and I trust that the Lord has been good to you today. Amen? Amen. 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 And so it is that today we're going to be talking about a very serious and very solemn topic. We're doing part two of our study on the mark of the beast. This past Sabbath, Saturday, uh, the Lord blessed in a very mighty way, and we were able to hear the word of God and to understand the mark of the beast in a very serious, biblical, solid way that it did not leave room for confusion. And so it is that there's even more evidence that God wants to give, and that's why we prepared part two. Now, I'm going to say in advance, for those of you who were not here this past Sabbath, this past Saturday, uh, I have to let you know that you missed out on a very powerful gem. But the good news is that it was recorded. And so it is that you want to definitely communicate with us about those recordings. There'll be a table on the side later on that you can talk to them about how do I get the recording of what took place this past Sabbath when it was talking about the mark of the beast, and you'll be brought up to speed because tonight we're going to move in advance. And uh, if you didn't get this past weekend's message, it's going to be a little hard to understand and probably fully appreciate everything that will be said, but I trust that if you get that presentation and then watch it along with tonight, I believe anything that is crooked in your mind will be made plain. Amen? Amen? All right. So as we prepare our hearts to receive the message tonight, as has been our custom, the best way to do that is upon our knees. And so if you're able to kneel, I would like to invite you to kneel with me for a word of prayer. If you can't kneel, just bow your heads where you are. But if you can kneel, let's kneel together and let's pray together. Our loving Father, we are so grateful. Thank you so much for the gift of life, health, and strength. Thank you, Lord, so much for the opportunity to learn your words of truth and to apply them faithfully in our lives. And we just ask now that you will abide with us and grant us your wisdom, that you will please forgive us of our sins and grant us the presence of your Holy Spirit. And we pray that he may come and minister to our hearts and open our eyes and help us behold wondrous things out of your word. And I thank you that you have heard this prayer, but more importantly, that you have answered it. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen like for you to turn your Bibles with me to the book of Matthew chapter 3. And I want you to watch this. Matthew, we're going to the third chapter because I want to remind us of a prophecy. You see, we've been doing an Unlock Revelation series. We've been going through the prophetic books of Daniel, Revelation, as well as other areas of the Bible. And we've been looking at the Word of God and how it prophesies of things that were going to come to pass that it might help us believe once we saw that it came to pass. And we did a nice calculation on when the Messiah was going to come. It was a beautiful prophecy coming out of the book of Daniel, the ninth chapter. And uh, there was a mark. There was an anointing that was supposed to fall upon the Messiah after 483 years from 457 B.C., which would take us right to A.D. 27. This was the image that I showed you when it was Christ being baptized in A.D. 27, and Jesus was, in fact, the anointed one. It happened right on time in Scripture. But I want you to watch more carefully what I'm about to show you. In Matthew, the third chapter, and if you're there, please let me know by saying amen. amen. Here's what the Bible says. It says in Matthew 3, in verse 16, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, if you look at verse 14, the individual that was instrumental in the baptism of Jesus was John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Now, the reason why this is important is because it was in A.D. 27, right on time with the prophecy of Daniel 9, that the Messiah was anointed. Okay? He went into the water, came up out of the water, the Spirit of God anointed, came upon him like a dove. And then, of course, heaven, God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So Jesus fit the mark perfectly. It was an incredible, watch my word, event. It was an incredible event because John baptized Jesus. Jesus comes out. There's a lightning that's coming upon Jesus like the form of a dove. And then there's a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That was an incredible event. Would you agree? Amen. Now, watch this. Go to Mark 1. Let me show you something. I'm going to teach you a lesson about teaching Bible prophecy. In Mark, the first chapter, now watch this. I'm going to show you a nice lesson learned from Jesus when you study Bible prophecy. There's an incredible event that took place 
recognizing the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. The Messiah was anointed. Now, watch what the Bible says in Mark 1 and verse 14. Watch what the text says, and when you get there, please say amen. Amen. All right, in Mark 1 and verse 14, it says, Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Question, is this before or after his baptism? Would this be before or after his baptism? What do you think? This would have to be after because John is now put in prison. Before John was put in prison, he was free to be in the water to baptize Jesus. So obviously, this is after the baptism. You would agree with that? So this is after the prophecy was fulfilled. Would you agree with that? All right, watch verse 15. In verse 15, it says, and saying, the time is fulfilled. Notice that, the words of Christ. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, what I want you to notice is that when Jesus would teach the fulfillment of prophecy, it was actually wise for him to use current events to help the people understand where they were in Bible prophecy. Do you see that? Jesus would use current events. The current event was his anointing. That's when he said the time is fulfilled. Because now that prophecy of the Messiah when he was going to come, that prophecy was now fulfilled. He is the Messiah. So now he's now coming on the scene and he's preaching the kingdom of God. So he's preaching the gospel. So true ministers of Bible prophecy, the most beneficial Accurate ministers of Bible prophecy are those who do not just simply tell you what the prophets of old said, but what they're going to do is show you what the prophets of old said and tie it in to current events. Are you following? This is literally the model of the master. Jesus himself taught us this method. And the reason why this is so important is because we dropped a serious Bible-based spiritual bomb this past Sabbath. This past weekend, we wanted to identify what is this mark of the beast. And when we taught that thing, that thing shook many of our hearts, did it not? It caused us to search our hearts and to say, Lord, I want the seal of God and not the mark of the beast. And that was God that was speaking to our hearts. And so what we're going to do is we're going to review. You'll remember there was a list of questions that had to be answered. Now, for those of us who are here this weekend, I'm going to allow you to be the teacher and I get to be the student. A list of questions that I need answered. And so, teachers, I'm going to ask you to please help me out. You'll remember that this past weekend there was a question that was asked. The first question was, who was the first beast of Revelation 13? What's the answer? Who was the, you you don't sound like a sure class. And a sure class has the sure word of prophecy, amen? All right, so talk to me like you're a sure class. Who was the first beast of Revelation 13? Who was it? It was the papacy. You remember that? The papacy, the Roman Catholic Church system. We saw that clearly from Revelation 13 when it came to that first beast, the sea beast. Now here goes the next question. Who was the second beast? Who was the second beast? The United States of America. We saw that clear as day. Then, third question, what is the image of the beast? The image of the beast was the uniting of what? Church and state, civil and religious union. We identified that. Then the next question, what is the seal of God? The The Sabbath. Amen. We saw that all from Scripture. The Sabbath. Then, the question of all questions. The question even the world wants to know. The question even Morgan Freeman on National Geographic very recently was doing a whole subject on the mystery of God and the mystery of 666. And Mr. Freeman doesn't even know the answer, but we do. What was the answer to the question when we said, what is the mark of the beast? The enforcement of Sunday observance. All of this was substantiated from the Bible. Now, the reason why this becomes so important is because now we're going to tie some things in and we're going to look at some current events. I'm going to take us as far back as 1998 and then I'm going to bring us right up to 2016. 
and I'm going to talk some current events with you. Is that all right? I want to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. And so I want you to watch carefully what we are going to be reviewing on the screen. You'll remember that we looked at a very powerful statement. First, we proved it from the Bible, but then we saw that in Revelation 13, that beast power had a mark. And so what we did was we went right to the beast power, Rome, and we said, Rome, Church of Rome, Roman Catholic Church, what is your mark? And they gave the answer. You remember? They said, Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible. How could Rome say such a thing? The church is above the Bible. And this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. My brothers and sisters, that is a blasphemous statement. For Rome, the church of Rome, to say that we are above the Bible and the way that we can prove it is we change the Sabbath to Sunday observance. And all the Pentecostals and all the uh, Presbyterians and all of the apostolics and non-denominationals, while they go to church on Sunday and try to say we do it because of Jesus, Rome says, no, you don't. You do it because of us. Rome is not afraid. The Roman Catholic Church is not afraid. They're saying the reason why you got so many Christian organizations that go to church on Sunday has nothing to do with the Bible. It's not in the Bible, but it is on the records of the Roman Catholic Church system. And so it is they make it very clear that this is our mark to prove that we are above the Bible. But I'm so thankful that God in these last days, did you know God described his group in the last days? Can I show you what he said? Go to Romans, Revelation 14. In Revelation, the 14th chapter, God described his people in a beautiful way according to Scripture. And I'm so thankful that his people will not be following the beast power, but they're going to follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes. Notice what the Bible says in Revelation 14. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Amen. The Bible says in Revelation 14, right there in verse 12, here's the group that God recognizes as his and his own. He says, hear is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ, my brothers and sisters. And so in these last moments of earth's history, while much of the world will be following the teachings and the dogmas of Rome, God says, I will have a last day people that love me. And they will follow Jesus. Somebody says, I didn't read anything in Revelation 14, 12 that says they love me. No, yes, you did. You just didn't catch it. Did you see what it said in Revelation 14, 12? It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that what? Keep the commandments. commandments. Is that what it said? Keep the commandments. Now, question, what makes any man or what makes any woman keep God's commandments? Go to John 14. Notice what the Bible says in John 14. What is it that makes any man or any woman keep God's commandments? Because God made it clear. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments. So what is it that enables the woman or the men to keep God's commandments? John 14. The Bible says in John the 14th chapter and the 15th verse. And if you're there, please say amen. Amen. The Bible says in John 14 and verse 15, Jesus says, if you what me? If you love me, what did he say to do? Keep my commandments. Commandments. God says in prophetic vision through John the Revelator that in the last days, while the rest of the world will be following the commandments and traditions of men, God says in the last days, I will have a people that will keep my commandments. Why? Because they love Jesus. Do you love him? You see, my brothers and sisters, I don't care what anybody says. A man can say he loves his wife. A man can come home and say, honey, I love you, I love you. But when that man comes home and he beats his wife, When that man comes home and he cusses out his wife, when that man comes home and he demeans and puts down his wife, if that man behaves like that, he can say, honey, I love you all he wants. The actions prove he's a liar. Now, we say amen to that because we understand that. But watch 1 John. Go to 1 John chapter 2. Let me show you something. You see, we understand that on the earthly realm. But watch 1 John chapter 2. Notice what the Bible says. In 1 John, now we're considering the second chapter, and notice the very forceful language that God uses in his servant John, and notice what he says. 1 John, we're looking at chapter 2, and notice what the Bible says in verse 4. The Bible says in 1 John 2 and verse 4, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. Is a liar. 
and the truth is not in him. My brothers and sisters, we can say we love Jesus all we want. Jesus says, I want proof. Because a man can beat his wife and say he loves her, but that man has to show proof. And that proof is that he will never put his hands on her ever again. My brothers and sisters, we are given the privilege to demonstrate proof that we love Jesus. And Jesus says, the proof is that you will keep my commandments and you won't violate them. And any man who says he knows me and is going to not keep my commandments, Jesus says he's a liar. That's strong language, isn't it? It's a, it's a serious accusation when we call a man or a woman a liar. And you need to make sure that you are correct. And I believe that when God calls a man a liar, he's correct. And so God makes it clear that in the last days, there's going to be a group that will not be following under this mark. But they're going to have the seal of the living God. They are going to follow Jesus. They're going to follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes. But those who receive the mark of the beast, my brothers and sisters, oh, it's going to be a terrible day. You see, in that same book, Revelation 14, it says in verses 9 to 11, it says, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment descends up forever and ever, and they will not have rest day or night. Whosoever worships the beast in his image and whosoever receives the mark of his name. I would not wish that on even my enemy. Amen. And so God gives all of us a chance to be counted amongst the patient saints. Now, when it talked about the forehead and the hand, we need to answer this question. Do people who worship on Sunday as a holy day, do they have the mark of the beast right now? No. Go to Revelation 13. Let me show you something. Here's the key you got to catch when you look at the, this, this subject of the mark of the beast. Go to Revelation 13. Let me show you something. Is it that... If I go to church on Sunday right now, you know, on Sunday, sometime, well, yesterday was Sunday. And yesterday we had a religious meeting. We were talking about health and the gospel. Did that mean we had the mark of the beast? God forbid. So therefore, we need to understand, if somebody worships on a Sunday right now, does that mean that they have the mark of the beast just as simple as that? No. Watch the prophecy carefully. Revelation 13. It says in Revelation 13 and verse 11, watch the text. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, but he spake as a dragon. Verse 12. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and what the earth? Cause it. The word cause means force. Don't lose that point. That's put there in the Bible on purpose. He causes the earth, and them which dwell therein, to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, when we go further down, verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and what? Cause. That word cause means what? Force. Cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now watch verse 16. And he what? Again, what does cause mean? Force. It says, and he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. So if Sunday worship is connected to the mark of the papal authority. It is not simply that one goes to church on Sunday, but when the time comes that people all over the world are forced to observe that which is contrary to God's commandments, it is at that time that anybody who still is going and observing Sunday as the Lord's Day, it is at that time that if they do that, they will receive the mark of the beast. So it is Sunday observance enforced. Are you following? Now, wait a minute. Did it say causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship? Is that what it said? My brothers and sisters, how can you be forced to worship anything when we have religious freedom. How could you do that? Unless what the prophecy is showing is that a time is going to come when our religious freedoms will no longer be available. I wonder if we're going through agitations right now where religious freedoms are being pushed out of the way as a result of a crisis. Do any of you have Muslim friends? You see, my brother, I have several Muslim friends. And there's many things that I respect about my Muslim brothers, though I cannot fully agree with their position on Allah, salvation, and etc. But there are many Muslim brothers and sisters that I know that are wonderful people. And here's the thing that gets me. 
When we get to a place that because of a terroristic crisis that we now have to take away religious freedoms to tell a Muslim man that you cannot come into the land of the free and the home of the brave purely because of your religion. When we will begin to talk that kind of stuff and these are the front runners that are winning state by state throughout the United States of America. That means that we are entering in a time where it becomes very easy to see how quickly our religious freedoms can poof, disappear right in front of our faces. Amen. Our country is developing more and more of a climate to become intolerant with religion. Have you heard of gay marriage? Amen. Have you noticed that if a man or a woman dares to simply say, I believe in the biblical model of marriage, and I believe that according to the word of God, that God made one man and one woman to be married, and that is all that the God of heaven and the God of the Bible recognizes. Have you noticed that if someone simply uses their freedom of speech, have you noticed that persecution is becoming a thing of the day? My brothers and sisters, religious freedoms are slowly but surely disappearing. And so it is, it would not be long, and it is not fanatical to think that a time could come where the powers that be could compel people how to worship, when to worship, and why to worship. It's not far-fetched. And so it is when we start looking at Bible prophecy, do people who worship on Sunday as a holy day have the mark of the beast now? The answer is no. Many people are doing this ignorantly, and that's why God is raising up people who will not hold their peace to obtain the favor of any. They will tell the truth, though the heavens may fall. I read a little book that says the greatest want of the world is the want of men, men who will not be bought or sold, men who in their inmost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to call sin by its right name, men whose consciences are as true to duty as the needle to the pole, men who will stand for the right, though the heavens fall. I believe we are living in such a time as this, and while we're seeing many cowards, that are no longer standing for biblical Bible truth because it's not politically correct. God says, I'm going to raise up a people. And God says, and if I can't get it from the clergy, I'll get it from the fishermen. God says, I'll take the ignorant ones. God says, I'll take the people with no degrees. God says, I'll take those people, and though they may not have degrees, God says, under the unction of my Holy Spirit, I will use them. And they will teach what I've raised up my ministers to teach. And so it is, brothers and sisters. You might be one of those ministers, so you pay careful attention to what the Word of God is saying to each and every one of us. Right now, nobody has the mark of the beast. But a time is coming where after we've heard the truth and we're still doing this, oh, my brothers and sisters, we will receive the mark of the beast. And so it is. When it made a statement, forehead and hand, what does that mean? In his forehead or in his hand? It's very simple. Notice this. The forehead represents the mind. There are some people that's going to believe that Sunday is the Lord's day, even though the Bible clearly says otherwise, because most so-called Christians don't live by the word anymore. Right. They live by my bishop. I live by my pastor. I live by my elder. I live by my priest. I live by what they say. But Christians are to live by the word. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's how Christians are supposed to live. And so it is that when Christians go back to the Bible, you will find it's getting less and less popular. Biblical religion is becoming more and more extinct. But it's the only religion that God acknowledges. And so it is that God makes it clear, number one, the forehead represents the mind. That's why the seal of God It's interesting. Look at this point right here. The forehead represents the mind. A person will be marked in the forehead by a decision to keep Sunday as a holy day. The hand is a symbol of work. The hand is a symbol of work. You have the Bible references. A person will be marked in the hand by working on God's holy Sabbath or by going along with Sunday laws for practical reasons like job and family. Cooperation. Now, the reason why this is deep to me is because of this. It's interesting that Satan says forehead or hand. In other words, Satan says, you can believe it or don't believe it, just be quiet and cooperate with it. Satan says, I don't care, forehead or hand, just do what I say. That's all that he wants. 
He doesn't care if we believe it or not. But you know what's interesting about the seal of God? Forehead only. You ever thought about that? Go to Revelation 7. You see, mark of the beast, forehead or hand. You can either believe it in your mind or just simply cooperate with it with your actions. Satan says, I don't care. But notice God, Revelation 7. In Revelation the seventh chapter, the seal, very different. In Revelation 7, notice what it says. Revelation 7, starting at verse 1, the Bible says, And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the what? Seal. Now watch this. Having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. Watch verse 3. Saying, hurt not the earth, neither the trees nor the sea, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their hands. Is that what it says? No. It says in their where? Forehead. Notice forehead only. You know why God says that? Go to Hebrews 11. Notice what the Bible says in Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Why does God say it has to be forehead? Why, does, why do we have to believe what God says? Hebrews 11. The Bible says in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, Notice what it says right there in the sixth verse, Hebrews, the 11th chapter. And notice what it says as we consider Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Why does God say forehead? Because forehead is the decision center. It's where we make up our decisions and state what we believe. Why is it that God says, I want forehead and forehead only? Hebrews 11 and verse 6. The Bible says, but without faith. Without what? Faith. Without faith, it is is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must what? Believe. Must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God says you must have faith in my word. You must exercise belief in me. That's the only way you can please me. You see, there's a lot of people right now who exercise religion while they don't believe in God. God says, I'm not pleased. When a man and when a woman comes up and says, all to Jesus, I surrender, and they sing, I surrender all, Jesus says, nice song, but the real question is, did you believe what you just said? Because there's some people that don't believe in Jesus to surrender all. Some people have surrendered some to Christ. Sometimes we sing wonderful hymns. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. But when we sing that song, Jesus says, nice song, but the question is, do you really believe what you just sang? Sometimes we can sing songs, brothers and sisters. Sometimes we can preach sermons. Sometimes we can give out books with information, and we ourselves don't believe what's in the book. We ourselves sing songs we don't believe. We ourselves will preach sermons we don't actually believe nor live. God says, I'm not pleased. God says, do you believe what you're singing? Do you believe what you're preaching? Do you believe what you're handing out? God is not interested in our acting Jesus one day went to those Pharisees and he said, woe to you Pharisees and scribes, hypocrites. One day the Lord touched my heart and said, son, look up the word hypocrite in the Greek. I went to the word hypocrite in Matthew 23. I looked up the word hypocrite in the Greek. Do you know what the word hypocrite is in the Greek? Actor. Jesus literally said, woe to you scribes and Pharisees. You're a bunch of actors acting like you love me when you know you don't love me. God says forehead and forehead only. Only those who believe me. Only those who trust me. It makes no sense to sing trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. It makes no sense to sing that song if we don't trust him. It's like we're singing a lie. You understand that? So God says the devil he doesn't care if you believe. He says, forehead or hand, I don't care. He says, you don't have to believe anything I say. Just be quiet and do what I say. Uh -huh. Satan says, I don't care. But God says, no, the only people that come to heaven with me, the only people that come home with me, you got to believe what I said. Do you believe? God is very different, even from the devil. You understand that? And so it is when you look at the mark of the beast in the forehead or hand concept, this is how wicked Satan is. Satan says, I don't care if you believe. It has nothing to do with anything. He says, just cooperate with it. So even if somebody says, I believe in the seventh-day Sabbath, but in the name of supporting my family, I just got to do it. Satan says, I'm pleased. 
It doesn't matter, my brothers and sisters. This is how wicked Satan is. So he says, forehead, you believe it? Great. He says, oh, you don't believe it? No forehead? Hey, just give me your hand. Just cooperate. I'll keep your, I'll keep your paycheck coming. You see, my brothers and sisters, to stand for Christ, sometimes it means you got to lose. Did you know that? Sometimes it means you got to lose. Did Jesus lose a lot? Jesus lost a lot, my brothers and sisters. He lost a lot. And sometimes we're going to have to realize we're going to have to lose a lot. I know preachers right now, they won't even preach the truth because they're afraid of who's going to walk out. My brothers and sisters, you can't be afraid of none of that. Teach the truth. Tell them the truth. Because it's only the truth that makes people free. And so it is that God makes it clear. Forehead, mind. Hand, cooperation. Follow through. Just do what I say. That's the way God does it. You understand that? So this is how the Lord works these things out. So this is what God is trying to bring before us. So now, a powerful quote. This quote was put together by John, the late John Paul II, Pope John Paul. Pope John Paul, forgive me. And when Pope John Paul wrote this, this is something called Dies Domini. And what he wrote here was how the Roman Catholic Church always set up Sunday laws. I want you to notice what he says. When through the centuries she has made laws concerning Sunday rest, the church has had in mind above all the work of servants and workers. Now watch this quote carefully. When the church of Rome would set up Sunday laws, because sometimes people say, Sunday laws, are you trying to tell me that there's going to be a Sunday law where people are going to be enforced to worship God on a day contrary to his commandments? I am telling you, absolutely. Somebody says, that's impossible. I'll say, it's written on the pages of history. It's not hard. This is not a new concept. This is a very old concept. And so it is, Pope John Paul, he's telling us how, not only that the concept did exist, he's showing us how they made it exist. He says, when through the centuries, for hundreds of years, it says, she, the Roman Catholic Church, has made laws concerning Sunday rest, the church has had in mind, above all, the work of servants and workers. So whenever Rome wanted to pass Sunday laws, what Rome did not do was say, you better do it or else. You know what Rome would do? Rome would say, it will benefit you. This is good for you. You need time with your family. You need time to have time for your servants and for your workers. You need time to yourself. Rome presented Sunday laws in a way that was supposedly beneficial to the people that it was imposing its lies to. And so as a result of that, this was the success of Rome in passing Sunday laws. Now watch this. It says, therefore, this was John Paul's conclusion. Therefore, also in the particular circumstances of our time. Now, this was written in 1998. Listen to this. He says, Christians will naturally strive to ensure that what? Civil legislation respects their duty to keep Sunday holy. Wait a minute. Civil legislation? Do you, do you understand what that means? He's saying, Christians, go to government and tell them you want them to establish Sunday laws. Go to civil legislation and encourage them that we need Sunday laws. This article is called D.S. Domini, D-I-E-S-D-O-M-I-N-I, D.S. Domini, okay? You can Google that tonight, D.S. Domini. You can read the whole thing. Now, Pope John Paul was showing us the secret formula, the methodology of how Rome successfully passed Sunday laws, and they got the people to buy into it. Always present it as a way of encouraging workers to get some rest, families to spend time together. This is what Pope John Paul did. Do you understand that? Amen. All right, very good. Now let's continue. Time Magazine and Newsweek started coming out with these articles all of a sudden. This one was 2004. Why isn't Sunday special anymore? All of a sudden they started putting out these articles calling people back to Sunday observance. They started saying things like, for a lot of Americans, it's just another day you have to go to work. But for many people, they were saying, why isn't Sunday special anymore? 
And then they would, they would create something called Sunday blue laws. That's why even here in Michigan, as well as many places throughout the U.S., when you wake up early in the morning, you find a lot of those stores that are open 9 o'clock on Monday through Saturday are suddenly closed Sunday, and if they're going to be open, they can only open until after a certain time, which is typically 12, 11, 12, 1 o'clock, or what have you. This is because of something called Sunday blue laws. They're state laws, not federal. But nevertheless, it was all designed on the same purpose to try to maintain some level of sacredness to Sunday. Now, the reason why this becomes very interesting is because Newsweek came out with an article. I'm sorry, the, first, the previous one was Newsweek. This one is Time Magazine. Time Magazine says, and on the seventh day we rested, and then underlined they said, maybe those old blue laws weren't so crazy after all. They started going back and telling people, hey, maybe, maybe this Sunday thing, maybe we need to come back to it. Now, why is it important to look at this? Go to the book of Revelation 13. Let me show you another thing that we studied that perhaps we might have missed. Go to Revelation 13 again. And I want you to watch this. Revelation, we're looking at chapter 13, and I want you to watch this very carefully. Because what we're going to do now is look at verses 13 and 14, and I want you to watch the verses carefully. In Revelation 13, verses 13 and 14, notice what the Bible says. And when you get there, please say amen. amen. The Bible says in Revelation 13, verses 13 and 14, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the what? Earth that who? That they should make an image to the beast. Now, here's a really important question for me to ask you. Which one comes first, image of the beast or mark of the beast? Which one? Image of the beast. Because what is the image of the beast? The union of church and state. So first you have to have image of beast, then you can enforce mark of the beast. Doesn't that make sense? You cannot enforce Sunday observance until you first have a reunion of church and state. Make sense? So first you got to have church and state, image of the beast. After you have church and state, image of the beast, then you can enforce mark of the beast. Make sense? So notice, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. So is the image of the beast going to be set up from top down or from bottom up? It's going to be set from bottom up, from the people. You follow that? From the people. So when you read articles where we're hearing the voice of the people saying, we need to come back to Sunday. The true child of prophecy should understand, I need to get on my knees and start praying because something's getting ready to come. You follow that? So therefore, what I want you to watch carefully is look at the first beast and look at the second beast and watch how they're encouraging the people. This is why, what did Pope John Paul say? Look at it again. Therefore, also in the particular circumstances of our time, legislators. Is that what it says? No. It says Christians will naturally strive to go to where? Civil, to ensure that civil legislation respects their duty to keep Sunday holy. That's exactly according to prophecy. You follow that? They're encouraging the people. Tell the people, go to law. And when the people go to law, then they go to the powers that be, and the powers that be say, you want it, vote it, and we'll give it to you. You understand? This is how this thing is going to go down. So now let's continue. So again... Newsweek says, why isn't Sunday special anymore? Time magazine, and on the seventh day we rested. Maybe those old blue laws weren't so crazy after all. Never on Sunday, some retailers closing for religious reasons. All of these different agitations were coming. But then it wasn't just in America. It started to spread throughout the world, even to people like this. If there's one place I thought for sure would never establish Sunday laws, it was where this is. You know where that is? Just by the way they look. That's Israel. Notice, updated, March 4th, 2011. Will Sunday become part of the Israeli weekend? When you think of Israel, you think of Jews who keep the Sabbath. But notice what it says. It says, vice premier. Is that a small position? No, look at this. 
Vice Premier Shalom decides to launch a campaign on issue, says move would cause a revolution as people will receive more leisure and rest time. Notice they're promoting Sunday laws on a civil level so that people can have more rest and leisure. Whose method is that? That's exactly the papacy's method. Did we not read it? The way Rome has had success in passing Sunday laws throughout the centuries was focusing on workers and servants. Did we not read that? So watch this. It says, a decade's worth of efforts to push the government. Now see, why? in other words, why is it that bishops, pastors, ministers, popes, why is it that they don't just say to Sunday worshipers, hey, take the day off from work and trust God? That's, that's what Sabbath keepers are doing. As Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath keepers, we're encouraging the people saying, hey, trust God, know that he loves you and will take care of you, and remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We are not going to, to tell, we're not telling the members, go to government and tell them make Sabbath a law. They're not doing that, but that's what you're seeing on the flip side. Go to government. So look at what it says. A decade's worth of efforts to push the government to make Sunday a day off were renewed over the past two weeks after Vice Premier Sylvan Shalom decided to begin a campaign on the issue. Then it says, this would cause a revolution in Israel, Shalom said in a statement released Thursday. This would make our country more normal? Israel would become more normal having Sunday laws? That doesn't even make any sense, my brothers and sisters. It says, this would make our country more normal. Going on, give people more leisure and allow them to return to the work week on Monday a lot more rested. That was in Israel. Then how about this one right here? Vatican official exhorts Catholics to set aside Sundays for God and rest. Notice the date, July 19th, 2011. So notice what it says. Sunday should be a day for worship, rest, and time with family and friends. Notice the emphasis. Time with family and friends. Keep watching that. Time with family and friends, said Monsignor Miguel Delgado Galindo, under secretary for the Pontifical Council for the Laity. The church teaches us to set aside this day, the first day of the week on which we remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ for divine worship and for human rest. The Monsignor recently uh, told CNA, on Sundays, Catholics should participate in the Holy Mass, the unbloody renewal of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, and the greatest expression of worship and adoration that man can offer to the Lord our God, he said. Sunday should also be a day devoted to rest for rest with family and friends. Monsignor Galindo underscored the importance of blessed John Paul II's 1998 apostolic letter, D.S. Domini. So I want you to notice that he's pointing people back to the letter that said, Christians go to government and tell them you want Sunday laws. So while Seventh-day Adventists supposedly sound crazy for telling people a day is going to come where Sunday laws are going to be passed in America, Rome is very busy making sure that that's exactly what Christians go to government to establish. Is it really crazy? Is it really far-fetched considering there were Sunday laws in America in the past and there's going to be Sunday laws being pushed to have it again? So continuing, it says, we need to realize that we need more time with family and friends. It is hard to give them time during the week because of our professional and social commitments, he noted. Sunday rest is a human necessity. Now continuing, June 6, 2012. This was none other than Pope Ratzinger. He said, the demands of work can't bully people out of needed time off. Pope ben and this was at the meeting of, for families. Thousands upon thousands of people come together all over the world. And it says, the demands of work can't bully people out of need of time off, Pope Benedict XVI said. Sunday must be a day of rest for everyone so people can be free to be with their families and with God, the Pope said. By defending Sunday, one defends what? Human freedom. I want you to watch that language. Watch that language. Then, after that, Philippines. I was in the Philippines. Uh, no, not Philippines. I was in Singapore. And literally, I told, Sing I told my friends in Singapore this information. I said, how is it that I'm an American and I knew this and you didn't? And we're telling them what's happening. Look, Singapore maids to finally get a day off. Well, what's the big deal if a maid wants to get the day off? No big deal. But watch this. Notice the date, March 6, 2012. We need to treat our foreign labor force decently, manpower minister tells parliament. Now watch. The Singaporean government... Why is the government constantly getting involved to establish Sunday laws? This is the part that we as Christians need to pay attention to. Why is the government trying to set up Sunday laws? This thing is like all around the world. 
So it goes on to say, the Singaporean government's recognition of a weekly rest day as a basic labor right will make the lives of migrant domestic workers better. Now watching, it goes on. This is bad news for women who are working, said 49-year-old mother of four children, Pumbong Ng, according to the paper. If I let her go out four days a month, it will be very hectic for me. I need to rest on Sunday too. So over and over and over again, Sunday law agitation from the government, just like prophecy is laying it out. Now, continuing, Eurozone demands that Greece mandates a six-day work week in exchange for second bailout. Greece was in so much trouble financially that from 2010 to 2015, they needed three financial bailouts. Three, that's huge. That's huge for a nation. And so it is, they started saying, look, we're, if, we, if we are gonna get another bailout, we need to start mandating people to work six days a week. In other words, make it law to work six days a week. So I wonder what day were they gonna make law that the people would not work? Notice what it says very clearly. Look at the date, September 5th, 2012, and what did they say? They said, but never on Sunday, says Greek Prime Minister Antonis Samaras. This is the last such package of spending cuts the Greek economy can take no more. So they were talking these things even from Greece. Now, continuing, watch it again, over and over and over again. Italy, December 19th, 2012. Vatican works to stop Sunday shopping in Italy. In what may seem an unlikely alliance, it says, the Catholic Church, trade unions, and Italian small business associations have joined forces in a bid to save Sundays from shopping and liberalize shopping hours. Continuing, it says, we need one day when everyone can rest. This is the origin of Shabbat, and in fact, even what organizations? Muslim organizations. Now, do Muslims believe in Sunday? No, but are Muslim organizations willing to support a Sunday law? That's why if it's not in the forehead, it can be with the, you understand that? That's how you can get Jews to agree to a Sunday law. They're not going to give up the Sabbath. They're just going to cooperate. That's how you can get Muslims to believe in a Sunday law. They're not going to believe that Sunday's the Sabbath, but they'll do it to cooperate with the hand. That's why Satan says forehead or hand. Continuing, going on, the Reverend Marco Scatalone of Campo Semporio, Italy, became an instant celebrity when he labeled Sunday shopping a sin and called on his parishioners to do penance for it. Sundays, he told the Correo del Veneto newspaper, are important, not just in the religious sense, they are one of the few occasions left for families to be together. That's 2012. I wonder what happened in 2013. And I'm gonna come back to 2013. 2013, is what I'm gonna close with. Because 2013 is so powerful that it's, gonna, it's just gonna tie everything into what you've been seeing. Now watch this. 2014, the World Sabbath of Religions Reconciliation. This is ecumenical. Now watch this. January 24th, 2014. The World Sabbath of Religious Reconciliation, the interfaith holy day of peace and reconciliation among all religious, races, ethnic groups, and nations. The World Sabbath held on the last what day? The last Sunday afternoon in January begins with a Jewish youth blowing the shofar, a Muslim youth chanting the Muslim call to prayer, followed by middle school, high school, and college youth giving additional prayers for world peace from many other religions, for example, Jain, Buddhist, Baha'i, Zoroastrian, Christian, Hindu, Native American, Sikh, Quaker, and Unitarian faith traditions, all of them coming together on World Sabbath Day. They're uniting. Everybody's uniting and coming together. Now, you remember I told you about the Jewish brethren, right? When they said we're trying to get this thing established? Notice, 2011, you remember that? They said we want to go ahead and push for the Sunday law to be passed in, in Israel. Well, guess what? Here it is, deal reached, 2014. Deal reached, an ongoing initiative to give Israelis more time off. Major coalition parties allegedly respond well to the move. It says uh, Sylvan Shalom, Naftali Bennett, and Rabbi Shai Piran have reached an agreement in the ongoing initiative to introduce Sunday as a day off from work and school, according to Channel 10, the catch free Sundays would only be once per month. Sunday laws, deal reached in Israel. It's all over the world. So again, when somebody says, man, you crazy for saying that Sunday laws are gonna happen in the world. You're crazy, is it crazy? My brothers and sisters, it's all over the news. It's happening 
all around us, literally, and you haven't seen anything yet. Because notice, senators suggesting a bill for all Americans to attend church on Sundays. Are we ready to play the clip? Watch this one. Probably we should be debating a bill requiring every American to attend a church of their choice on Sunday. That was Senator Sylvia Allen yesterday talking about the possibility of forcing people to attend church. But today she was walking away from those comments, literally. You don't have any interest in talking about that? No. Thank you. Appreciate it, folks. Well, why don't you want to talk to us? Because I don't, don't talk to you. Thank you. You don't Bye. talk to me. Nope. However, it didn't take long for her to change her mind. About an hour after 3TV tried speaking to Allen, she took to the Senate floor defending her comments on religion. Last night in a very late appropriation meeting, and we were all extremely tired, uh, I made a remark about uh, America's in a need of a moral rebirth. Allen then said she couldn't understand why her remarks would be controversial. To try to bring back this moral rebirth to our country, to turn our hearts back to good things, that that is some sort of amazing thing for me to have said, and that would be offensive to people. Allen believes the country is heading in the wrong direction, and to prove her point, she told a story about her youth. I can remember, it wasn't until high school I understood there was anything like heroin, drugs. It just wasn't talked about in our society. It was a different time. People prayed, people went to church. Regardless, her initial comments spread across social media. And later, she questioned why her idea of legally requiring church attendance would even be newsworthy. I was chased across the foyer by a Channel 3 news reporter when I said I did not have any comments. So notice that she doesn't have any problem with it, but these are people in positions to influence others. We should start looking to pass laws for Sunday observance. This is something that's been agitated for a very, very long time. But one of the people that's been agitating it as of late, that is perhaps the most popular man on earth, literally, is none other than the present Pope, Pope Francis. It was in the Daily News, June 6th, that he began to chime in on his comments. And notice what he said. Pope Francis says opening businesses on Sundays is not beneficial for society because the priority should not be economic but human and that the stress should be on families and friendships, not commercial relationships. Now, a lot of people are paying very close attention to Pope Francis. He has tremendous influence. Presidents, kings, queens, everyone seems to give him a lot of weight. His statements carry much, much weight in our world, of which you will see very shortly. So I want to bring you back a little bit to a few hundred years ago, a man by the name of Martin Luther. Martin Luther was the one who was known to bring about the wonderful teachings of justification by faith. And when he taught justification by faith, it was revolutionary to the Christian world because everyone was in the darkness of the false teachings of salvation through penance and through paying things and so on to try to earn salvation. Martin Luther began to be known as the father of the Protestant Reformation. And I want you to listen carefully. Although there had been significant earlier attempts to reform the Roman Catholic Church before Luther, such as that of John Huss, Peter Waldo, John Wycliffe, it is Martin Luther, Luther who is widely acknowledged to have started the Reformation with his 1517 work, The 95 Thesis. Now watch this carefully. Luther began by criticizing the selling of indulgences, insisting that the Pope had no authority over purgatory and that the Catholic doctrine of the merits of the saints had no foundation in the gospel. The Protestant position, however, would come to incorporate doctrinal changes as sola scriptura, by scripture alone, and then sola fide, by faith alone. Obviously, Martin Luther's teaching spread like wildfire. Anybody who knows the history, even if you've watched some of the movies that you can see where they tried to act out Martin Luther, you can see the impact that Martin Luther had all over the world and obviously throughout Europe. But then something very interesting took place here. The Roman Catholic Church responded with a what? Counter-Reformation, initiated by the Council of Trent. Much work in battling Protestantism was done by the well-organized new order of what? A lot of people don't know who and what Jesuits are. 
Jesuits are an organization within the Roman Catholic Church that are basically the last effort of their military force, if you will. Not literal military, but spiritual military. In other words, when the Church of Rome begins losing its influence, the Jesuits came into existence to counter the Reformation with Martin Luther. And what they would do is they would use every tactic necessary to try to win the hearts of the people back to Rome and to crush out Protestantism. The Jesuits' purpose of existence is to crush out Protestantism. If you're a Pentecostal, you're supposed to be a Protestant. If you're a Baptist, you're supposed to be a Protestant. If you are an apostolic, you're supposed to be a Protestant. If you are non-denominational, you're supposed to be a Protestant. So whatever you want to call it, the Jesuits were literally brought into existence to crush out Protestantism to counter the influence of the Reformation, bringing people back to the Bible, bringing people back to righteousness by faith. The reason why this is so important is because what people do not know is Pope Francis is the first ever Jesuit pope. He's a Jesuit pope. When you look at the Jesuits, it started with a man by the name of Ignatius Loyola. And here's what you learn. The Society of Jesus is a Christian male religious congregation of the Catholic Church. The members are called Jesuits. The Society is engaged in evangelization and apostolic ministry in 112 nations on six continents. Jesuits work in education, founding schools, colleges, universities, and seminaries, intellectual research, and cultural pursuits. Jesuits also give retreats, minister in hospitals and parishes, and promote social justice and ecumenical dialogue. This is what Jesuits do. Also, the society participated in the Counter-Reformation and later in the implementation of the Second Vatican Council in the Catholic Church. So Jesuits were very much to counter the Reformation. Now, why is this important? When you think of the word ecumenism, the word ecumenism means this. The aim of unity among how many Christian churches? All Christian churches throughout the world. Question, is this bad? Is that bad? Some say yes, some say no, some don't know. Well, here's the point. Ecumenism is the aim of unity among all Christian churches throughout the world. Now, when you study ecumenism, the question is, what's really wrong with it? What's really wrong with ecumenism? Well, here's the point. There is a such thing as true unity, but there's also a such thing as false unity. There is true unity, but then there's false unity. Go to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Let me show you biblical true unity. Ephesians 4. When you go to Ephesians, the fourth chapter, I'm going to show you the principle of true unity. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians, we're considering chapter 4, and I want you to watch carefully verse 3. Ephesians 4, and we're going to look at verse 3. And when you get there, please let me know by saying amen. amen. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, verse 3, it says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So who is the instrument that promotes unity according to the verse. The Spirit. Very good. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. So it is the Spirit of God that brings about unity. Now, how does the Spirit guide us to be unified? John 16 and verse 13. In John 16, notice what the Bible says in verse 13. And this is very, very key. In John 16 and verse 13, notice what the Bible says when we consider how does the Spirit of God unite the people. Notice what it says in John 16 and verse 13. It says, how be it? When he, the Spirit of what? When the Spirit of truth is come, what's he going to do? He will guide you into all truth. The only true unity, according to God, is unity in truth. Are you following? That's the only true unity. There is no unity in lies. Lies have nothing to do with the truth. You can read 1 John 2 and verse 21 for that. 1 John 2, 21 says no lie is of the truth. So you cannot be united in lies, and it's that unity is initiated by God. You can only be united by truth. The spirit of truth is the one who unites us, and he unites us by guiding us into all truth. Are you following? Amen. Now, false unity. When you think of false unity, Genesis 11. Let's go to Genesis, the 11th chapter. 
in Genesis, the 11th chapter, which happens to be the foundational chapter of Babylon. In Genesis, the 11th chapter, we see false unity. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 11, when you get there, please say amen. amen. Genesis chapter 11, and now we're looking at false unity. In Genesis 11, notice what the Bible says, verses 4 to 9. You see, these are people who united, but let's notice their motive. The Bible says in Genesis 11, And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is what? They're unified. Notice that. They're one. But going on, it says, Behold, the people is one. And they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So notice, they are unified. They are one. But the problem is their oneness was brought together to rebel against God. You see, there's a unity that God leads where we unite in God's truth and we become one. And we become children of the truth and children of light. But under the instruction of Satan, these individuals, they wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted to establish their own righteousness. They wanted to preserve their own lives. And they wanted to do it not repentant, but still rebellious against God. But it was still unity. So there's a unity that is for God and his truth. And then there's a unity that is against God and his truth. And that's why you cannot believe anything when people say we're trying to unite. You got to ask them, what governs your unity? What is it that governs your unity, brother? What is it that governs your unity organization? Oh, we just want to unite all the Christian pastors. Okay, but what is the context of your unity? Well, we want to push aside all doctrine. Really? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for correction and for doctrine and for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good work. Why would you want to eliminate doctrine? Jesus himself taught doctrine. So what you're finding is a lot of churches are now coming together, but it's not based on truth. It's just coming together indirectly to rebel and fight against God's truth. Amen. So just because Jesuits promote ecumenism, just because people want to unite does not always mean it's a good thing. you got to test it, my brothers and sisters. Do you understand that? Amen. When you got a pastor that says, I want to meet with all the pastors, we got to unite you got to say, wait a minute, what's governing your unity? Is it Bible truth or is it something else? And so it is that when we see ecumenism, we can see it as something far more dangerous than good. Now, why is that important? Because the man who today is presently the picture for ecumenical movement is none other than the person of the year. Now, this is not something against Pope Francis himself as a person. But what we have to understand is that if you're carefully watching the movements of Pope Francis, like every child of prophecy is supposed to, one thing I realized about Pope Francis very quickly, he is a very faithful Jesuit. He does exactly what Jesuits want to do. Remember, what does Jesuits want to do? They promote ecumenism, but they also were raised up to crush out what? Protestantism. They want to crush out what Luther taught. They want to crush out what Tyndale taught. They want to crush out what Wycliffe taught. They want to crush out what Zwingli taught. They want to crush out what John Huss taught. They want to crush it. That's not good, brothers and sisters. That's bad. But watch this. It gets deeper. How popular. Obviously, you're very popular when you're the person of the year in Time Magazine. That's pretty popular. But then I watched this video clip. Watch this one. I'm absolutely convinced that Pope Francis is the Pope whom the Spirit gave to the church today. He came out and immediately changed the narrative. 
Why? What is going on here? Everybody knew that this was an important moment for the church. The first thing I thought was, that's not right. He's not wearing the right clothes. As if the Pope was going to make a mistake about these things. It wasn't a mistake, it was a message. I had never seen someone command that kind of attention in the American media. Not even President Obama. It's not fluff. He is the figure in the world stage today. It's not a, a change of doctrine, but it's, it is a change of emphasis, and it's, it is a huge change. The old model of governance and presence and so forth is very much being challenged. Change is always difficult, I understand that. If you're uncomfortable, it's not the Pope's problem, it's really your problem. We have to trust in God's providence for the church. This is a very good man. You know, he's so powerful that for years, American presidents have tried to get Israeli and Muslim leaders to come together for peace. And they have not had success. But then one day he decides to go, and notice what it says, Pope Francis, peace plea at Israel-Palestinian prayer meeting, June 2014. Look at what it says. Pope Francis has urged Israeli and Palestinian leaders to show courage to seek peace in the Middle East. He has accomplished what presidents of the United States could never have accomplished. It says the Pope was speaking after hosting joint prayers at the Vatican with Israeli President Shimon Peres and his Palestinian counterpart, Mahmoud Abbas. Mr. Perez said making peace was a holy mission. Mr. Abbas spoke of a comprehensive and just peace. The leaders proceeded to plant an olive tree as a sign of peace. Peacemaking calls for courage, much more so than warfare, Pope Francis said. Instill in our hearts the courage to take concrete steps to achieve peace, he prayed. So here it is, he's traveling all over the world, and he's a man that's instrumental in bringing peace to the people. And people are amazed, and they're looking at the power of this influence of how is it that he's able to bring peace amongst people who are at war. You're basically looking at Ishmael and Isaac. You understand that? Israel... Isaac, Islam, you understand that? So Israel, Isaac, Ishmael, Islam. And now the head of Islam, the head of Israel, the two are coming together and they're working together for peace and it's the Pope who did this. Now the reason why that's deep is my mind. When I saw this article, you know what God did? He said, hey, Dwayne, you remember Daniel? And I said, yes. And you remember what Daniel said about the fourth beast power? You remember what Daniel said about the little horn power, the papacy? Let me remind you. The Bible says, speaking about the little horn, it says, and through his intelligence, through his policy or intelligence, also shall cause craft or deceit to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself where? In his heart. So on the outside, he's going to look real humble. But he's going to magnify himself where? That's prophecy. It says he's going to magnify himself in his heart, and it says, and by peace shall what? How do you destroy by peace? That was in the Bible talking about the fourth peace power. And we just saw it. Literally, going there, everybody's coming together, planting olive trees, everybody's coming together. The world says, oh, this is beautiful. The Christians say, Lord, prepare us because a crisis is coming. And so it is, that it does, but it doesn't stop there. It says, by peace he shall destroy many. But then the Bible says, he shall also stand up against the prince of princes. You see, the position of the pope is considered to be the position of God on earth. And he will stand up against the prince of princes, but the Bible goes on to say, but he shall be broken without hand. You understand that? And this is why we, as children of the Bible, children of Bible truth, we understand for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. And I'm telling you, 2014 was a very serious prophetic year. You know why? Because not only was all these peace movements taking place, but remember, what's the great purpose of the Jesuits? To crush out what? All of a sudden, this man comes up. Pope Francis' friend. His name 
Bishop Tony Palmer, he came before a group of evangelical Christians, and he told the evangelical Christians, he said to them, Luther's protest is over. And then he said, is yours? Literally, you can go to YouTube tonight and you can Google this. You can go to YouTube and pull this whole video up and you will watch him tell all the Protestants there's no longer a need to protest because we now believe what Luther believed. This is literally what it says. And you know who was there? A very popular evangelist. You know what his name is? Kenneth Copeland. Anybody know Kenneth Copeland? That's that man right there. He was right there. He watched the video, and he watched Pope Francis say, I am yearning that this separation comes to an end and gives us communion. Pope Francis said, this whole Protestant Catholic thing, I pray it comes to an end, just like the Jesuit order teaches, us, teaches them to do. And then you know what Kenneth Copeland said? Kenneth Copeland said, heaven is thrilled over this. A Protestant. He said, heaven is thrilled over this. And then you know what happened next? He became the chief advocate to get other ministers to come together to join. Do you see it? My brothers and sisters, I'm not smart enough to put all this together. You see, there's a plan going on. You can look up each and every one of those names. John and Carol Arnott, huge ministry. Huge. Kenneth Copeland, huge ministry. Brian Stiller, huge. Thomas Schermacher, James Robinson, Betty Robinson, Jeff Tunnicliffe, and then, of course, Bishop Tony Palmer. Huge ministries. And what are they doing all over the world? They're telling you the protest is over. You don't need to be a Protestant anymore. And you know what, they, you know what the conclusion of Bishop Palmer's statement was? You don't need to be a Protestant anymore, so there's only one thing left to be. What do you think it is? Come back to Catholicism. And you know, the, so, the apostate Protestants are saying, heaven is thrilled over this. Do you understand how, as one who loves Jesus, there's no way I could keep my mouth shut? And that's why I have to come before you and tell you this? Because I don't know who else is going to tell you this. You understand? That's why you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do it. You can't be afraid. You got to say, look, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'll tell you this. This is the truth, my brothers and sisters. And so this is where we are today. So continuing, all of a sudden, same year, he dies. It's very interesting. Gets into a motorcycle accident, and he dies. So when he gets into the motorcycle accident and he dies, at least that's the report. Some people believe he didn't really die. They believe it was all faked out. Might have been. We don't know. But it, the report says he died, okay? But when he died, I thought it was interesting, same year, because this is July now, 2014, he died. But then, of course, Catholic online, huge. I mean, they get one million impressions per day from Catholics all over the world. Really big website, Catholic online. And what they did was they put together a tribute to Bishop Tony Palmer. And when they put together a tri tribute, it was very interesting. Look at what they said. A scholar and leader among evangelical Protestants in the United States, Timothy George, the dean of Beeson Divinity School, also wrote a piece for the same publication entitled Our Francis II why we can enthusiastically join arms with the Catholic leader. So these are Protestants now. I want you to always catch that. These are Protestants. So it says, George wrote, Francis succeeds two men of genius in his paper role. John Paul II was the liberator who stared down communism by the force of his courage and prayers. Benedict XVI was the eminent teacher of the Catholic Church in recent history. Francis appears now as the pastor, a shepherd who knows and loves his sheep and wants to lead them in love and humility. The new Franciscan moment is the season of the shepherd. Catholics and evangelicals are the two largest faith communities in the body of Christ. Without forgetting the deep differences that divide us, now as never before, we are called to stand and work together for the cause of Christ in a broken world. That's what's coming. Okay? So I'm looking at all of this behavior, and then I thought, this, this to me was the most incredible thing, and this happened last year. Now we're up to 2015. Last year, Gretchen, Fox News, August 28th of last year. I want you to listen to this video, because I thought to myself, remember, 2014, Luther's protest is over. Martin Luther's protest is over because Rome says we believe in justification by faith too. The problem is those who really believe in justification by faith keep the commandments of God. He forgot that part somewhere along the lines. But nevertheless, then this happened. And I want you to watch this. This is the next move that Pope Francis made, which again made it even easier for Protestants to say, you know what, 
I think it's all well, we need to join with the Roman Catholic Church. Notice these comments. Time now for my take with a hat tip to my colleague Chris Steyerwalt, who also flagged the same story that piqued my interest today. It's about Pope Francis, once again doing something unexpected. As you've heard me say before and may have learned from my book, Getting Real, my grandfather was a Lutheran minister who grew our church in Anoka, Minnesota from 800 to 8,500 members at retirement. As you also know from history, Martin Luther was not a popular figure with Catholics back in the 16th century, key figure in the Protestant Reformation, excommunicated in 1521, never allowed to return to the Catholic Church. But next month, right near the Vatican that I had the pleasure of visiting just a few weeks ago, Pope Francis will name a hilltop square Piazza Martin Lutero in memory of Martin Luther and his achievements. Yes, his achievements. Once a heretic in Catholic history books, Pope Francis is instead choosing to honor a man no one ever thought would get such praise from the top Catholic. So I just want to say today, thank you, Pope Francis. And thanks for being part of The Real Story. I'm Gretchen. I thought it was so interesting. Very, very, very ingenious. 2014, Luther's protest is over. So in other words, you don't need to pay attention to what Martin Luther was saying anymore because we supposedly believe in it now. That was point number one. Then 2015, now he says, in fact, what we're going to do is we're going to honor Martin Luther now. If, that is not gonna, if that's not going to dull the mind of Protestants to say, hey, maybe these guys are not so bad after all, and make it easy to drop the guards, not understanding the order and role of Jesuits, which is to crush out Protestantism. You see, all of these things are coming together, and then, of course, how could we forget the address to Congress? How many of you watched the videos? How many of you watched when he did the address to Congress? How many of you downloaded all the documents and the transcripts? I downloaded every single one of them. And I went through it, because that's what children of prophecy are supposed to do, pay attention to the beast power and his moves. So therefore, when we looked at it, started looking. Reuters, here's what they said. September 28th, 2015, Pope Francis dove into some of the United States' thorniest political debates during his historic visit by urging the world's wealthiest nation to welcome what? Immigrants to end homelessness and do more to address climate change. So these were the things that he was talking about. Now watch this. Sometimes his political messages were blunt. Notice, his political messages were blunt like when he pleaded before the U.S. Congress for Americans to end hostility towards immigrants. Other times, they were more subtle like the climate-conscious Pope's decision to ride around in a tiny Fiat rather than a gas-guzzling SUV. While Vatican officials said the Pope was only restating church social teachings and not making political statements in his first U.S. visit ever, many in the public and across the political landscape saw it differently. Notice what they said. Among them, 42-year-old Gabriela Munoz of Brooklyn, an undocumented immigrant from where? Mexico, who said the Pope's comments on immigration had given her a lot of hope and faith. In other words, when he came and he gave his address before Congress, the thing that he emphasized quite a bit was immigration. Stop being so hard on the immigrants. Let more immigrants come through. Let down the walls, etc. And that's why Donald Trump and Pope Francis are absolute enemies right now. You understand that? That's why. Because you see how Trump is coming real hard on Mexico, etc. Pope Francis is like, lay easy on the guys. Come on, lay back, pull back, etc. So that's what he's pushing. Now, the reason why I thought this was interesting is I started thinking, wait a minute. He wants America to come down on the immigration issues. Who are the largest amount of immigrants that come into America? Mexicans. So here it is. I went to CNN. Asians on pace to overtake Hispanics among U.S. immigrants. Asians are on pace to take over, but look at this. U.S. population in 50 years is expected to be 441 million, with 88% of the growth from now until then coming from immigrants. Huge. Then here's what it said next. Pew estimates that 11.3 million immigrants in the United States are unauthorized to be here. The number of unauthorized immigrants from Mexico peaked in 2007 at 6.9 million. It's gone down ever since, the report says, and reached 5.9 million in 2012. Even so, notice, they still make up the majority of unauthorized immigrants. Now, here's the question. Pope Francis comes to the U.S. Of all things that he wants to talk about, he emphasizes immigration and causing more leniency on immigration. Who are the top immigrants, especially unauthorized, that are already coming into the U.S. still today. They are our brothers and sisters from Mexico. Now watch this. 
if we let down the walls even more, become more lenient, and allow more to come in and become legal, then that means we're going to have a massive, huge influx of our brothers and sisters from where? Mexico. Mexico. Now, question. What is the predominant religion of Mexico? Catholicism. How is the image of the beast going to be set up, from top down or bottom up? up. So if the power is with the people, and if you can get more Roman Catholics in the system and in the country, how easy would it be to pass what Rome wants passed? Always pay attention to the underlying movement. My brothers and sisters, this stuff is all laid out. This is all the movements that are bringing about Revelation 13 to make that thing come live and in stereo. And that's why I saved the best for last. Pope Francis, what are you trying to accomplish with all of your movements? Now the year that I have not covered, 2013. It was the New York Times that came to Pope Francis and asked him a very important question. This question was about the Sabbath. Let's notice what he said. Responding to the question, do we need to rediscover the meaning of leisure? Pope Francis replies, together with a culture of work, there must be a culture of leisure as gratification. To put it another way, people who work must take the time to relax, to be with their what? Families, to enjoy themselves, read, listen to music, and play a sport. But this is being destroyed in large part by the elimination of the Sabbath rest day. More and more people work on Sundays as a consequence of the competitiveness imposed by a consumer society. In such cases, he concludes, work ends up dehumanizing people. Last October, about 250 bishops met in Rome for a conference on the movement called the New Evangelization, which focuses on reawakening faith in those already baptized. One of their conclusions was, even though there is a tension between the Christian Sunday and the secular Sunday, Sunday needs to be what? recovered in keeping with they wrote in keeping they wrote with John Paul's D S Domini my brothers and sisters you know I'm basically done now I know that a great number of God's people we don't research deep we don't, we don't think through the verses, study the text out, and then do like Jesus. What did Jesus do? How did Jesus teach prophecy? He would always connect old prophecy with current what? Current events. Remember that? These current events connect very beautifully, very powerfully with Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 11, Daniel 12, Revelation 13. My brothers and sisters, all these things tie up very powerfully But you know what it's going to do? It takes time to sit down, watch the movements, read about it, connect it back to prophecy, watch the point here, connect it over here, watch the point here. It takes time. And you know what? You can't do that when you're busy watching Desperate Housewives. You can't do this when you're busy watching Dancing with the Stars. It takes a focused mind. Sometimes we're so busy watching the networks and the programs and stuff like that. So then when we start going through all these steps to really understand where we are in time so that we can answer the question, what should we do? The average person doesn't know. We've been studying for basically an hour and 25 minutes, my brothers and sisters. And sometimes... If it were a two and a half hour movie, some of us could sit up and it would have a hundred percent of our attention. I want you to understand what's going on in the minister's mind. He's looking at the people and he's saying, if it's a movie, we're up. If it's, you know, the other entertainments of life, we're up. But once it requires just a bit more thinking, we're not used to it. We start getting tired. My brothers and sisters, I'm telling you the truth. I began to understand why Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah. Eight people entered on the boat. Just eight. And the question is, why wasn't it more? 
it wasn't because God didn't want to save them. It was because the people did not value the privileges that was before them. My brothers and sisters, time is almost finished. Time is almost finished. The handwriting is ever so on the wall. And some of us are worried about Kanye West and Kim Kardashian and what they're going to name their next baby. Some of us are worried about whose celebrity is going to marry who. My brothers and sisters, do you see the handwriting that's on the wall? Are you getting your house in order? Have you gotten to that place that you realized the games you were playing with God and said, Lord, I can't play any games anymore. When I see all the way up to 2015, I, listen, I didn't have time to put the 2016 up. It's not that it's not there. Prophecy is unfolding so fast. It's hard for the teacher of prophecy to compile it, cut it, paste it all, and put it together to present to the people of God. My brothers and sisters, the handwriting is on the wall. The question is, what are you going to do about it? You see, Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Those who hide under the shadow of the wings of the Almighty, those are the ones that shall be protected. But where's your walk with God? The question is, which one do you want, my brothers and sisters? Do you want the seal? Are we preparing to get the mark? Because you know what? The world is ready. God's people are not. And so, my brothers and sisters, this is a solemn message. Parents, think about your children. Ask yourself, how much of my children understand this? Think about your relatives. How much of them understand this? Think about all these people we know, we love, and so on, and how much do they understand this? Lord, are we getting ready? God is trying to impress upon our hearts these things that have been taught for years. It's finally coming to pass right in front of our faces. This is not the time to go spiritually numb. And so, my brothers and sisters, my question to you is very simple. If you are saying in your heart, by the grace of God, by the grace of God, I can see the handwriting on the wall, and by the grace of God, I want to be ready to receive the seal of God rather than this mark of the beast. I'm inviting you to stand to your feet. You stand to your feet because you recognize it. You see it. Lord, it's all happening. What do I need to do? I must run to Jesus before it is too late. I must hide under the shadow of the wings of the Almighty. And my brothers and sisters, you're going to find that as you take this stand for Christ, he will take his stand for you. He's not afraid of taking a stand for you. The problem is he don't have enough people that love him to take a stand for him. This is why you're standing. This is why you're standing. And so it is, my brothers and sisters. The Lord wants to get us ready because time is almost finished. By the grace of God, let's take our walk seriously. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Loving Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you have taught us tonight. We thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the truth as it is in Jesus. Father, I pray, help us to truly be a people prepared to meet our God. Forgive us, Lord, of our laziness. Forgive us of the times where we heard your voice and ignored it. But I pray, help us to take seriously into heart what you are showing us tonight. And let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart finally, by your grace, be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. It is our prayer we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you all. God bless you all. Amen.